I, I was down at the Nimitz Museum five, eight years ago. Uh, one of the great people in the world in this preservation of World War II history is a lady by the name of Helen McDonald. I think she's retired three times, but she keeps coming back to organize the major events at the Nimitz Museum in Fredericksburg. It's wonderful. This guy's PT boat and his squadron is in their museum. PT, I can't remember the number that's down there. 305 is in the museum there. It was one that was with him in the Mediterranean. But uh, wonderful uh, exhibit, wonderful place. And uh, they focus only on the Pacific. Uh, Helen said, you got to get Bill Sloan up. Well, we got him up. Bill, welcome to Minnesota. And I want to introduce uh, his wonderful wife, Lana, who's going to be doing the video uh, support. Thank you for that uh, very gracious introduction, Don. And my thanks to all of you who have taken the time to come here tonight. It's a pleasure to be back in Minnesota again with a group of folks who care as much as you do about preserving our country's history. My wife and I had a wonderful visit when we were here two years ago, and I'm very honored to be invited back. It's also a pleasure and a privilege to have a large group of World War II veterans with us tonight. We owe each of these guys a debt of gratitude that can never be repaid. But let's at least pause for a moment and give every veteran in our midst a heartfelt round of applause. Thank you. Our focus tonight is on a 60 mile long Pacific Island called Okinawa and the horrific struggle that took place there between two vast armies 64 years ago this spring. I spent the better part of two years researching and writing a book about that struggle. The book is called The Ultimate Battle and that word ultimate is not used lightly in the title. But before we go any further, I want to mention that several of the men who helped win that battle are right here in this room with us tonight. It's a very special privilege to have them with us, and you'll be hearing from some of them a little bit later. To the surprise and relief of every American who was there, the ultimate battle of the Pacific War began as peacefully as a picnic. The amphibious landing at Okinawa on Easter Sunday, 1945, was a piece of cake. A stroll in the park, as one Marine put it. Wave after wave of U.S. assault troops walked ashore with virtually no opposition. In many sectors of the beachhead, hardly a shot was fired at the invaders. Army and Navy medical teams waited for a flood of casualties that never came. U.S. troops found themselves in a beautiful, almost uninhabited pastoral countryside where neat farms and small villages dotted the rolling landscape against a, black, a backdrop of pine-fringed hills. Rapidly advancing American infantrymen picked and ate fresh tomatoes along their line of march. Others passed fields of Easter lilies in full bloom. Abandoned barns, gardens, and livestock pens yielded vegetables, chickens, eggs, and an occasional pig soon to become roast pork. <laughs> Gentle Okinawan ponies wandered out to greet the newcomers, and many were temporarily adopted by Marines and GIs. But the peaceful interlude didn't last long. Tens of thousands of enemy soldiers and masses of heavy Japanese artillery lay hidden and waiting in the rugged heights a few miles to the south. The Japanese had constructed three ingeniously designed networks of defensive fortifications along the principal east-west ridge lines of southern Okinawa. When the Americans finally managed to dislodge them from one network, using exhaustive corkscrew and blowtorch assaults with tanks, flamethrowers, artillery, and grenades, 
the Japanese commander, General Mitsuro Ushijima, ordered his troops to withdraw to the next line of defense. And then the whole brutal process started all over again. The first fortified ridge line was anchored by two pieces of high ground designated as Kakazu Ridge and Kakazu West. And this was where the first serious fighting erupted on April 4th, D-Day plus three. After that, the struggle continued around the clock for 78 days. Before the battle for Okinawa ended, Nazi Germany surrendered. Adolf Hitler committed suicide. America celebrated VE Day. President Franklin Roosevelt died of a stroke. And General Simon Buckner, the top U.S. commander at Okinawa, became the highest ranking U.S. officer to be killed in action in World War II. Almost 50,000 young Americans became battle casualties at Okinawa. And another 35,000 suffered psychological disorders that left them unfit for combat. This was where battle fatigue and post-traumatic stress syndrome first entered our medical lexicon. During those 78 days, the folks back home were so frequently and understandably distracted by other momentous events taking place around the world that Okinawa often didn't receive the public attention it deserved. Yet even today, in an age when the average U.S. citizen knows distressingly little about our country's history. The name Okinawa still strikes a, a familiar chord, and most adults are aware that a battle of some magnitude took place there during World War II. What isn't as well known, however, is that Okinawa was the largest combined air, sea, and land military operation ever undertaken by the United States. It was far larger in terms of total American manpower firepower, equipment, and casualties than the invasion of Normandy in 1944. It pitted 185,000 assault troops of the U.S. 10th Army with a total strength of 541,000 men against Japan's deeply entrenched 110,000 member 32nd Army. U.S. ground forces were supported by 1,500 Navy ships and thousands of fighting aircraft. Hurled desperately against them were nearly 2,000 Japanese kamikaze suicide planes. And caught in the no man's land between the two armies were more than 350,000 helpless, displaced Okinawan civilians. In the slaughter that raged there from early April until late June 1945, a quarter of a million human beings, more than half of them innocent men, women, and children, died violent deaths. But even the enormous casualty figures don't begin to convey the full misery, suffering, and horror of those three months on Okinawa. Even many of the men who somehow survived the carnage later found it impossible to describe or explain what happened there. Consequently, many veterans simply refused to talk about that terrible time when they returned home. There were no words to convey what they'd seen and felt and done during those endless days and nights of combat. There was no way for friends and family to comprehend the stress and terror that left tens of thousands of American GIs, sailors, and Marines with physical and psychological scars that would never heal. One of those tight-lipped survivors was my late father-in-law, PFC Al Henderson who fought on Okinawa with the 96th Recon Troop of the 96th Infantry Division. His outfit was one of the first U.S. units to face enemy forces in strength when it stumbled onto the outer works of a major system of Japanese defenses in the island's heavily fortified southern ridges. In dedicating the ultimate battle to Al's memory, I noted that, uh, like numerous other Okinawa veterans, he never talked about what happened to him there. Back home in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, where he lived until his death in 1993, he was known as a friendly guy with a sharp wit and an infectious grin, a talented gunsmith and a skilled hunting and fishing guide. 
the sort of person who can make interesting conversation on a wide range of subjects. But whenever the topic turned to Okinawa or the Pacific War, he invariably fell silent and seemed to withdraw. It was sometimes perplexing to his children and grandchildren, and occasionally I wondered about it myself. But as I concluded in my dedication after interviewing close to 70 surviving Okinawa veterans and reading some of the letters Al wrote home during the battle, now I can understand why. To help you understand why, I'd like to read a short passage from the prologue to the ultimate battle. Featured players in this brief drama are a young man from Dallas, Texas named Jack Armstrong and other crew members of a tank nicknamed the Ticket to Tokyo. Their location is a few score yards from a warren of underground enemy fortifications known as Kunishi Ridge. The date is June 10th, 1945. Tank Commander Jack H. Armstrong was bleeding from both ears, addled by a concussion and deafened by the shell that had just ripped a jagged eight-inch hole through the center of his Sherman tank, missing Armstrong by a foot or two at best. The M4A1 Sherman was one of three tanks that had moved out ahead of infantry units of the 1st Marine Division this morning to scout enemy-infested Kanishi Ridge, the last remaining Japanese stronghold near the southern tip of Okinawa. When they'd come under intense artillery fire, the other two tanks managed to beat a hasty retreat. But Armstrong and his crew, grinding along in the lead, weren't so fortunate. In the soundless void whirling around him, Acting Sergeant Armstrong wondered if he was seriously wounded maybe dying. Death was a constant companion these days for men of the 1st Marine Tank Battalion, and the expectation of being killed or maimed at any moment was as much a part of life as breathing. But now death felt especially close and intimate, and as Armstrong squinted through the tank's smoldering innards at the young second lieutenant sprawled a few feet from him, he understood why. The lieutenant, who'd come along on their mission strictly as an observer, was still writhing in agony, but it was obvious that he'd be dead soon. His belly was split wide open and his intestines spilled out into his lap. His left forearm hung by a thin strand of mangled flesh. This was the lieutenant's first combat mission. It would also be his last. The lieutenant's mouth moved and Armstrong read the plea on his bloody lips without hearing it. Oh God, Mama, help me. Armstrong turned to see Corporal Stephen Smith, the tank's driver, crawling toward him. As tank commander, it was Armstrong's responsibility to take charge of the situation. He nodded toward the lieutenant. I hate to move him, but let's try to get him outside, he told Smith, feeling the, fi the words vibrate in his throat. If we take another hit, we're all dead. Armstrong watched as the lieutenant pulled out his K-bar knife and severed the thread of tissue that bound his ruined left arm to his body. When the arm fell away, its former owner dropped the knife and looked at Armstrong. That might make it a little easier, he whispered. With Armstrong attempting to hold the lieutenant's exposed organs in place, he and Smith half carried and half dragged him down through the escape hatch in the floor of the tank. Behind them, Private David Spurkey, the designated loader for the 75 millimeter cannon, moved to aid the Sherman's bow gunner and assistant driver, PFC Ben Oakham, who was moaning and bleeding from wounds in his arm and leg. It took what seemed like an hour for the five of them to make it to a nearby shell crater that was barely far enough away to keep them from being blown up with the disabled tank if it should explode. By the time they laid the lieutenant in the deepest part of the hole, his eyes were glazed and his face was grayish. Give me some morphine and get out of here, he whispered. They may open up on us again any second. Armstrong's hearing was beginning to come back and the lieutenant's words were faintly audible. We can't leave you here like this, he said. We'll try to get you a medic. Just go, Jack, the lieutenant said. Don't waste your time. That's an order. 
Smith broke open one of the needle-equipped morphine packets that each Marine routinely carried and injected the dying man in the neck. Armstrong put some extra packets beside the lieutenant's right hand, and Sperky tried to tie a belt around the stump of his left arm to slow the bleeding. The lieutenant was a new replacement who just joined the battalion as a platoon leader, and he'd been around only for a day or two. Armstrong couldn't even remember his name, but he seemed like a decent enough guy. He was a friendly, easygoing sort who got along well with the tank crews. He was also a hell of a lot tougher than he looked. Any man who can cut off his own arm with a K-bar has to be one gritty SOB, Armstrong thought even if he's too deep in shock to know what he's doing. Aye, sir, Armstrong said. We'll send help back as soon as we can. In his day's condition, Armstrong almost forgot that he was under strict orders to destroy the gyro stabilizer unit on the tank's 75 millimeter gun to keep it from falling into enemy hands. So he had to stagger back to the Sherman, drop a grenade into the unit, then scramble away to safety. Back at the crater, he took a last look at the lieutenant, who was very still and ashen, but still appeared to be breathing. Then he bit his lip and turned to help Smith with the wounded gunner. As they stumbled back along the draw they'd come down a few minutes earlier, a burst of fire from Japanese rifles and automatic weapons kicked up dust inches from their heels. Armstrong took one brief glance over his shoulder at a hillside literally crawling with Japanese each of them firing at the fleeing tankers. Then he ran for all he was worth, pulling Oakham along by his good arm and thinking, those guys must be the worst shots in the Japanese army. How can all of them be possibly missing us at once? This was the third tank that had been blown out from under Armstrong in just over a month. The first by a volley of armor-piercing shells from a Japanese anti-tank gun, the second by a landmine. Four or five guys, both tank crewmen and members of the infantry fire team accompanying the tank, had been wounded in the blast from the landmine, at least two fatally, and Armstrong had lost a damn good driver to the anti-tank gun. But this third time seemed worse than the others. The image of the lieutenant lying in the shell hole haunted Armstrong, and he couldn't block it out of his mind. Oakham was dragging his bad leg behind him, and Armstrong was gasping for breath and wondering how much further he could run when he spotted a rice paddy dead ahead. He pushed the driver over the bank into the shallow water and jumped in after him. Then both of them slogged desperately through the oozy, reeking mixture of blood and human excrement toward the safety of a rear area a half mile away. On June 21st, 1945, 11 days after Jack's third tank was destroyed, the Okinawa campaign was officially declared over, although fighting actually continued for several more days. The end brought cheers from the battle-weary Americans, but it also brought quiet prayers of gratitude and solemn reflection as veterans' thoughts turned from personal survival to their thousands of lost comrades. The massive devastation left behind after the battle is hauntingly symbolized by this photo of a lone Marine framed by a massive shell hole as he surveys the ruins of Naha, Okinawa's capital city. At the moment this picture was taken, the only thing most U.S. soldiers, sailors, and Marines had to look forward to was the impending invasion of Japan's home islands an operation that every man among them dreaded, one that was expected to claim more than one million American casualties. But based on the horrendous loss of life at Okinawa, President Harry Truman made the agonizing decision to use the atomic bomb against Japan in hopes of shortening the war and sparing countless human beings, both American and Japanese, from a similar fate. The wisdom and justification of Truman's action are still a subject of heated debate today. But I guarantee you this, you won't find many Okinawa veterans who regret what their president did. As one aging Marine corporal whose kid brother was killed in the battle told me with fire in his eye, 
if there hadn't been a Pearl Harbor, there would never have been a Hiroshima or a Nagasaki. Now we're going to have the honor of hearing firsthand from some of the Okinawa veterans who've joined us here tonight. These guys are the real experts on the ultimate battle. They're the quiet heroes who live among us, often unnoticed and too often underappreciated. They all have their own gripping personal stories to tell. I know you're going to want to hear every one of them, and also, I'll also be hanging around in case you have any questions for me. Thank you very much. God bless each and every one of you, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Hi, I'm Barb Gertzema, and what I'd like to do is introduce our Okinawa vets before we have the guests speak. So we'll start down here in the front. If you could tell me your name, and if you were on a ship or a carrier or whatever, tell me your name and what you with. And that's all. My name is Jim Anderson, and I served in the Marines in the Pacific. She said, Company K, 3rd Battalion, 5th Regiment of the 1st Marine Division. Thanks. Lyle Bradley, uh, U.S. Marine Corps. I was a pilot on uh, on the carrier, the uh, USS Bennington. Raleigh Larson from St. Louis Park, and uh, I spent three years in the Navy, amphibious Navy. Don Danker. I was in Company L, 382nd Infantry Regiment, 96th Infantry Division. Landed on Okinawa on April 1st and left in the latter part of July, 45. And I'll hold this up. You wrote a book. How about your book? Oh, Don is holding up my book, Love Company, <laughs> which I appreciate. That's uh, phonetic alphabet able. Baker, Charlie, dog, when he got to L was love, and I was in Company L, and I heard a number of conversations where it was called Love Company, so I called it Love Company, my book. It's a factually a story of the Battle of Lady and Okinawa. And he'll sign the book for you. We've got some in the back. Vince Matthews, 6th uh, Marine Division, and I was in uh, amphibian ducks with, uh, attached to the artillery, 15th Marines in Okinawa. I'm Mel Hecht. I was with the Baker Company, 1st Battalion, 4th Marines, and was, God looked over me, I'll tell you, because of the 53 machine gunners who made the initial landing on Okinawa. Four of us were not hit or killed, and I was one of the four. And I wasn't that good a, a Marine to, to be able to do, take care of this myself. I had help from up above, I'll tell you that. Thank you. Don Stevenson uh, from Spring Valley, Minnesota originally, but I ended up in the 8th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Battalion and we were working with the kamikazes on the north side of, uh, north of the airport. <laughs> I'm Harold Capon. I was with the 8th Marine, 2nd Marine Division. We went along with the 1st Division and some Army units across Okinawa. I landed on the first day and walked off on the last day without a scratch. I was pretty lucky. Thank you. Jack Christopher, 
uh, Aviation Ordnance Men First Class, uh, PBM uh, Patrol Bombing Squadron 27. We were at Okinawa four days before the invasion, actually in a, a group of small islands called Kamaramaretto, and uh, we flew patrols around the island. Then after we, the island was secured more, we flew any shipping missions, China and uh, Formosa and Korea. I'm Wes McCoy, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, 1st Marine Division. I was a bazooka gunner attached to Company A. There were 60 of us that made the invasion and six of us at the end. I'll set this one out. <laughs> I don't get up and down too fast. I was in the 96th Division, anti-tank company 381. I can't say I was anything but very proud of what our division did, and I wouldn't miss a reunion unless I was dead. <laughs> I'm Eric Duvall uh, from St. Paul. I was with the 1st Marine Division, Division uh, uh, the 11th Marines uh, uh, I battery as a forward observer. Landed H plus one and walked off the island without a scratch. Elmer Swenson of St. Paul. I was with Battery A, 106th Field Artillery Battalion, 27th Division, and uh, we were lucky. We only lost one man in our whole battery, and they never did find his battery, uh, body. Oh, my grandson is Sven Sungard, the meteorologist on Channel 11. <laughs> I'm in Quentin Denial, Company C, uh, Headquarters, 1st uh, Battalion, 106th Infantry, 27th Division. My name is uh, Bill Bryce. I was in the 4th Regiment, 6th Division of the Marines. Uh, I did get hit. I said it wasn't serious because I get hit in the head, but it wasn't serious. It took my eyebrow out and opened my scalp up all the way along, took a furrow out of my ear. And the first thing I remember after coming, I was stunned, of course. I did a flip and I landed on the guy who was loading my BAR magazines. And he responded with the loving tenderness of a Marine. He was swearing at me. <laughs> No. <laughs> I, I, you, you know, I, both my hearing aids went out on me tonight just before I got over here, so if I if say anything, I won't be able to hear it. But anyway, I was with the 27th Army Division, and the Army, 27th, made up of New York and, and New Jersey fellows. I joined them over, over in Hawaii. I went to an invasion of Saipan with him. We lost over 1,000 killed there in, 20, in the 27th Army Division. So we were shorthanded when we came, went to Okinawa. I don't know why they even sent us over there. But anyway, we had, uh, we, we came from, come up from New Hebrides uh, on the 9th of April. I wrote an article about my three years in the Army. So I looked it up before I come over here too, so. But anyway, it rained harder in the hill that night. We, we dug holes and we were on, next morning we built a big bonfire. We were way behind the front lines in Okinawa. And um, so we built a bonfire to try to dry ourselves out. But anyway, uh, the, uh, the, we went on the line, on the front line on the, uh, I think it was the 20th of April or something like that. Anyway, but, but uh, I, uh, the rice paddy saved me, saved my butt on, on uh, Okinawa. I can tell you about two, two, two different things. I had a, I'd run across the rice paddy, there in between the hills, in front of, front of, front of, front of, front of, uh, 
a friend of mine was in front of me and, and the shells started dropping down. And one landed right in about 10 feet of, in the rice, rice paddy. The rice paddy is made up of water and mud. And he fell right in front of me. I looked down, I could see his arm was cut in two because I could tell the way it was laying across his back. And uh, so I saw him 50 years later. I said, well, I was looking for a one-armed guy. He said, well, my arm's about three or four inches shorter than it was before. But yeah, I was thankful to see that. But, but anyway, I, uh, I did, we did have a Navy liaison come with us one time. And um, that was quite an experience. Watch the Cor Corsair. I don't know, that's, that's not a Corsair up here, I don't think. It is. It's got the inverted wings, Corsair. Huh? I uh, she's trying to tell me to stop talking. But anyway, anyway, we called in this, we had some hills out in front of us, so we called in the, Air, the Navy Air Corps to come in and bomb and scrape those hills. And of course, of course, of course, Sarah, he's got four, four, four rockets underneath each wing. But anyway, they, they let go of one, one simultaneous on each one of the wings. And I looked up and the darn looked like a propeller stop. I know it didn't stop, it's just a, Optical illusion. It just momentarily stopped it. But anyway, they strafed it. But anyway, I, I was, I, I was thank, thankful I could come through. All right. So I'm going to pass this on to someone else. Well, I can go along with that, gentlemen, because I was a Navy CB. I don't know if there's any others here tonight. But uh, we went to work and rebuilt the Yana Blue airstrip so then his airplanes could land. Do we have any other vets in the audience? Noble Scroggins, I was on the USS Aquarius. I was in an amphibious outfit, put the Marines ashore, glad they took my place there. Ten days later, we hauled out and left it to them. God was very good to me, so I worked for him the rest of my life. I'm Jim Fackler. I was a Navy medic with B Company, 1st Battalion, 7th Marine Division. Uh, Mr. Sloan mentioned Kanishi Ridge earlier. It was the only time in the Pacific that the Marines made a night march. On the north side of Kanishi Ridge was a, a valley about a third of a mile wide. It was, so it was covered with such heavy rifle and machine gun fire we could not cross in the daytime. So we waited t till night and we went over in the, in the dark. And uh, we had quite a firefight in the morning. Uh, this is Raleigh Larson. And Raleigh, uh, can you tell us where did you grow up? I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. And um, I grew up in lots different parts of St. Paul because by fifth grade, I had been to five elementary schools. And that's because my dad was always looking for a better deal in renting a, a kind of a small little flat. T tell us where you graduated from high school. <clears throat> graduated from uh, Johnson High School. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> and uh, my very best friend as a teenager was a girl named Doris Linnell. And she's here with me tonight because we were just friends for a long time. And then we've been married almost 63 years now. Oh, great. <laughs> Very good. Mm. No, you're not done yet. <laughs> when um, you got out of high school then, how did you join the service or why did you join? Talking okay. The story of how I got into the service, was that it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. December 7, 1941, you all remember that. 
And uh, Doris and I were in college at that time. I was a beginning freshman. And when that happened, that attack, all of us young guys, like hundreds of you out there, were determined to do something about that. And that's what happened for me. I knew I wanted to get in the service pretty quick. So after that, December 7th, by March, early March 2nd, I was enlisted in the Marine Corps. Now this is kind of a different story because I discovered there was a pre-officer candidate program. Can you all hear me okay? Pre-officer candidate program, that sounded quite interesting. And so um, I went on and applied for that and was sworn into the Marine Corps. But at that time, apparently the Marine Corps had too many officers. And so some of us young guys in the pre-officer program uh, just had to mark time by continuing in college. So we were encouraged to stay in college, and I think they wanted, wanted us to be a little more mature if we're going to be officers. So anyway, that's what happened, and I wasn't called in until July 1st, 1943, on active duty. And then I was sent into the, um, the, v, uh, the, the V5 program, no, V12. My memory is bad these days. Um, and so I was in that uh, pre-officer program at Notre Dame University. How did do you, you want to go further than that? Now I want to get to Okinawa. What did you do and <clears throat> how did you get there? Um, well, I, I finished um, my work in the V-12 program, and then I was sent to uh, Columbia University as a midshipman. Now, this, happened, this is a crazy deal, the way it happened. I, nobody had ever heard of this before. But when we were at Notre Dame, there were just simply too many future officers in the Marine Corps and too few Navy amphibious officers. So they gave us a chance to switch uniforms, and one day I switched over from my Marine outfit into a Swabi outfit. Okay, so then how did we get to Okinawa? <clears throat> how did I get to Okinawa? Well, after finishing as ensign in the Navy, went to a training base in Solomons, Maryland. Not Solomon Island, but Solomons, Maryland. And uh, at that base, we were assigned for different uh, duties. And I was assigned to an amphibious uh, flotilla, Flotilla 4 of the US Navy, a group of 40 ships. <clears throat> and lo and behold, uh, the the uh, captain, the four striper, uh, somehow selected me to be his right hand man, and I was kind of like a kid. I felt like very inadequate, very unsure of myself. But anyway, that's how I got in to the, that that position, and he had um, requested uh, immediate duty. And so we got immediate duty with him, and we were sent through the island, through the seas, and through the Panama Canal, and over to Hawaii, and then on the way to Okinawa. And we got to Okinawa uh, a little bit uh, after many of you got there. Uh, the war had been going, the, the uh, attack on Okinawa had been made on April 1st, of course, as we know. And we got there about the first week of, uh, of May. So we were there for most of the campaign. Is okay. that enough? Sure, sure. <laughs> okay. So now, um, what did you bring us here tonight? What are these? Oh, um, 
daughter Jane just had this frame this afternoon. I couldn't believe it. And but it, um, this is, is a, we had a lot of, uh, our duties were like an, a lot of any aircraft and also landings. We, we had rockets uh, on our LCS. We had small ships, 158 feet long. But anyway, on this um, particular thing, this happened on May 12th when the, uh, we saw, I was up topside <clears throat> and a couple of Japanese suicide planes sneaked in. Nobody knew where they were coming. <clears throat> and they sneaked in after uh, about 40 feet of water, went up right near us and circled around and picked out the battleship New Mexico and the first one exploded, you know, hit, dis disintegrated. The second one, that's, that's this picture. Yep. <clears throat> the second one hit the New Mexico. I think it was on fire as it hit. It looked to me like we were very close. We were maybe three quarters of a mile or mile at the most, which is quite close at sea. <clears throat> and so, that was a dramatic experience for me, an awesome experience to see one Japanese man take the lives of 54 sailors and uh, 125 or so others who were casualties. And that's a big topic that sometime, I'm not sure if this group gets into, but the thinking system of the Japanese people at that time, it's a very fascinating thing. But for me, it was a dramatic experience. And this one, <clears throat> okay, what's this? Uh, one of my jobs, I was a staff officer. So the, uh, the uh, commander of the flotilla would send me out on all kinds of duties. I, con I connected with many of the skippers of our 40 ships. And this is one, uh, when one of our ships was hit, I'd usually get sent over to pick up all the secret and top secret and confidential data and which I did, <clears throat> and this was a, another dramatic experience for me because these are, are ships out on the picket lines. How many of you were on the picket lines at Okinawa? Ah, oh, that is the most dangerous duty, we were told, in the, in the uh, war for the Navy guys. Okay. But, um, Anyway, so I went and was able to get a lot of data and killed seven guys, wounded about 15 on the small ship of 70 people. And so that was another one of the really interesting and uh, ugly experiences for me as a young officer in the Navy. So. If you want to see this later on, and if you want to come up and look at it, the Japanese grade school children were often encouraged to write or to draw and write greeting cards to the um, kamikaze pilots. And this is one of maybe 75 to 100 um, greeting cards that was laying there. There were just piles of them. I took them. I scooped them up and sent them to Navy Intelligence. I saved only one. Wish I would have saved about 10, or enough to pass out here today. <laughs> but um, anyway, that was another uh, great, ex great experience and uh, very impressive on a young guy. I grew up in, uh, in Dubuque, Iowa. Now don't hold that against me, being in Minnesota. <laughs> and you attended high school there? I attended high school, all right. Okay, and then um, how did you get into the service? Well, I was going to uh, the University of Dubuque uh, in 1942, and I was on the boxing team, and uh, two of us uh, took a little break, and uh, we got talking about uh, maybe we should think about the Marine Corps. We went down the next day and enlisted in the Marine Corps. Uh, the uh, recruiting sergeant said, well, just stay in school. And uh, I was really nuts about aviation. Uh, anything with flight always fascinated me. I've been a bird chaser ever since and so on. And, uh, but at that time, you had to be a college graduate to get into aviation. And they just 
change that one week later. So that opened it up. So I signed up for Naval Aviation and uh, got through okay, and of course always had this love for the Marine Corps. And so as soon as I uh, got my wings, I, I transferred over to the Marine Corps. Close calls like anybody in aviation. We were losing 30% of all the guys that went into aviation when I went in. It, uh, it was uh, rather appalling. It's improved much more now. But anyway, uh, after I got I graduated from Pensacola, Florida, I went uh, west coast, and that's where we got Corsairs. Uh, that's this airplane here, uh, and uh, I feel very sentimental about this airplane. I went through all World War II in it, and also Korea. We were recalled Korea, and um, so I sat in the cockpit of one down at the uh, Oshkosh Air Show here two years ago, and I had tears coming down my face. You can't realize how sentimental you can get over a tank or an automobile or an airplane. But anyway, uh, it's very sentimental to me. Okay, now we're at Okinawa. And okay, uh, Okinawa, uh, I was on the uh, USS uh, Bennington. That was one of our big carriers, CV-20. And I was in VMF-123. Uh, VMF is Air Marine Fighter. And um, we, uh, our primary mission was to stop the kamikazes. And the reason we were on there, first of all, the Navy did not like Corsairs. Uh, but the, really, the, the F6Fs weren't fast enough to run down the kamikazes, so the Navy said, grab a hold of some Marines. So eight Marine squadrons went on board the big carriers. And I happened to be on one of those squadrons. And um, I only shot down uh, one kamikaze, uh, but uh, uh, how many lives we saved, like your commentary there, one kamikaze can do a tremendous damage to a ship. So uh, that was our primary mission. But uh, when we flow, uh, when we got into, uh, and I check, I check my log books here because I wasn't sure of the dates, but uh, April 19th was the first day we flew over uh, uh, Okinawa and uh, flew every single day after that till June 9th. And we would, uh, we would fly over there using, uh, doing uh, uh, close air support, uh, which this airplane is fabulous for doing, and that's what we really trained for. Our primary mission was to support troops, and uh, we felt very good about doing that. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's what we were doing, close air support, combat air patrols, and the combat air patrols was primarily to stop the kamikazes. So that was our two, two goals that we did. We had many missions, of course, and so on. And you being on the picket, boy, we loved the picket people because you were picking up pilots all the time, so thank you. I just want to add for you, you were a hero of mine because the flyers, Marines, Army, and Navy, uh, were really doing a terrific job up there, and they lost hundreds of wonderful pilots mm -hmm. during those picket duty days. They were tough days. Well, but you guys helped us out a lot. Tremendous. Thank you. But, uh, okay, well, what else? Tell us about your logbook then. Oh, well, this, this is a logbook pilots keep, and I guard this with my life uh, because it has all the times and all, of, all the flights I've ever had in the military. Of course, I had some civilian stuff that's not in here, but anyway, um, that's what that logbook is. And so I had to go back and look in the logbook because it has every, every, every hop that I had over Okinawa. And um, at, uh, that's what that's for. Sir, can I ask you a question? Pardon? Can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Uh, Listen, had... Harry, you got a mic there? Oh. I've had several naval officers who were aboard those picket ships describe to me, and some of them very tearfully, uh, how you Corsair pilots would actually ride some of those kamikaze planes down into the sea and chop them up with your props. We had to do that a couple times. I never had to, but I know of three different pilots that did that. The propeller, you, you might not know this, that the propeller on the Corsair was the largest propeller that was put on a, on a, on a, uh, on a, uh, uh, on an engine at that time. And uh, it was heavy, and if you got up behind an airplane, you could bring the airplane down by chewing up the, uh, any part of the rear uh, airplane or wing, anything like that, and you could still land the airplane. It would bend the prop and ruin the engine and so on, but you'd still get it back. So we had to do that a couple of occasions. So, uh, but that's part of war. And then tell us about your book. Well, uh, we would 
compare notes over the years, uh, there were about 40 marine pilots in the whole area here, Wisconsin, Minnesota, South Dakota, and so on. So we'd get together once a month over a period of years, and we'd trade war stories. So a couple of us said, you know, we ought to put some of these things down. Uh, so that's what we started collecting. This was 1995. And uh, by 2007, we had everything completed, and we put it together a book. Uh, and uh, it's had a lot of publicity lately, and we're almost out of books. We had 3,000 printed, and we're down to 40 books left. So anyway, uh, what's, but, the what's the title? Title is Marine Wings. And uh, we've had a wonderful time doing this. And I have found out so much about people just reading what they wrote. And I've known some of these guys for over 50 years. And when they start writing things, you find out new things about them. And also you find out pilots love to talk, but they hate to write. <laughs> so we had to get headlocks on some of them in order to get them right. But anyway, it's been a great learning experience. And um, so uh, somebody else, and one of the guys t today mentioned the fact that uh, he had a hook. Now some of you don't know this, but occasionally if I get in trouble in a class, I taught class, uh, uh, biology in Noka Senior High School for a number of years. So you know you have to use some clubs sometimes, you know, when people get out of hand. <laughs> Boy, I wish I would have had this a few times. This is the hook that we put on the back of the Corsair. And when you land on a carrier, you just hope you pick up one of the cables. And you hope your hook doesn't break, because the book hook has broken a number a few times. But anyway, it's fabulous. And uh, I enjoyed flying off carriers a great deal. Uh, I did not like to live. I'm a, I'm a lousy Navy guy because I don't like to live on ships, but I love to fly off of them. So anyway, that's part of it. Thank you. Don, where did you grow up? Grew up right near Lake Tacomas in Minneapolis, and I graduated from Roosevelt High School. Okay. <laughs> when, um, how did you join the service? How did I? Yeah, did Uncle Sam call you, or did you volunteer? Well, I, I was a little over, I was 17 when I graduated, so I went to the University of Minnesota, knowing I'd be called up. The Army came around and gave a qualification test for what was called Army Specialized Training Program, and I took that test, and you had to have a good IQ, and I passed, so I knew when I was going into the Army, I'd be going to uh, go to college. It was like the uh, Marines had a college program, the Navy had, and the Army had one, and except the Army one uh, didn't last. And they did away with the Army program in March 44, and 2,000 of us uh, ended up in the 96th Infantry Division. So uh, uh, and then let's talk more about um, how did you get to Okinawa? Well, I got to Okinawa from Lady. We, I, mean, we, I made the amphibious landing on October 20th, 1944 on Lady. We fought the Japanese on Lady, defeated the Japanese 16th Infantry Division, which basically had part of, was one of the big Japanese divisions on Luzon and also took part in the rape of Nanking. And so we just sailed from Lady to Okinawa to land, and I landed on Okinawa on April 1st, uh, made the amphibious landing on April 1st, uh, Easter Sunday, Love Day, on uh, April 1st, 1945. And then uh, tell us about your book. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I never failed to put in a plug for my book, Love Company. It's uh, called, subtitle is Infantry Combat Against the Japanese in World War II, Lady in Okinawa. Those are two vastly different campaigns. Lady was a green hell, rained all the time, and my fatigues rotted off of me. And Okinawa, big difference there. We had very, had very little artillery operation. Uh, against us on Lady, but on Okinawa they had plenty of the big stuff, the 150 millimeter uh, howitzers. Don is also in uh, Bill's book, right? Yes. Oh, I'm in the book, all right. Yeah, you're in the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then now you want to show your slides? The, the, uh, the phonetic alphabet is Abel Baker, Charlie Dog, and, and we came to L, and in radio and, and um, 
telephone conversations to keep from getting mixed up on rifle companies and other companies, they'd say love company. Okay. So that's the title of my book. It's not a, I assure you, it's not a romance. <laughs> <laughs> now, should we show your slides? Your slides, should we show those? Pardon? Your slide, your slides that you brought with? Your slides. Slides, we're gonna show Oh, my slides. slides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I was gonna show them during my talk, but show a couple of them now. Okay. That's the 96th Infantry Division patch. Show the next one. That's me. <laughs> uh, that was taken on July 15th, uh, 1945, 15 days after we completed our mop up in Okinawa on June 30th. And uh, I had something in my fatigue pocket that really bulged out. I don't know what I guess, kept, I'm kind of skinny there. But uh, I had survived the battle and I'm pretty happy and I'm wearing my pearl-handled 45 caliber pistol, which is my basic armament, armament as a gunner on a 60 millimeter mortar. What else? Well, I was gonna show as I talked about this, but this is, there must have been 70 or 80,000 of these 7.7 .7 millimeter, uh, 31 caliber bolt action rifles that the Japanese army used on Okinawa. And uh, in my talk, I mentioned how the, we really outgunned them with our semi-automatic uh, M1 rifles. And once I was pinned down in a uh, shell hole, except there was a Japanese soldier firing at me from higher up in a hill. And the first shot lit right behind, by my head. And while he took the three seconds to uh, eject the shell, insert a new shell, aim, and squeeze off a shot. I was out of that shell hole and running like hell. <laughs> and he took a few more shots at me, and the shots would crack by, but they missed, thank goodness. And uh, that was one of my points, was uh, don't hesitate to do something rash and do it quick, and, but just don't do anything foolish. And, uh, <laughs> Okay, that, that's the Japanese killer. That's the 150 millimeter howitzer. They had over 50 of them on Okinawa. And in April and May in particular, they killed a lot of US troops, unfortunately. And uh, well, I'll tell about an incident there. I was nearly eliminated by a shell from one of the 150. Oh, that's another thing. The Japanese had a had a, a large a number of machine guns. That happens to be a Japanese uh, heavy machine gun, and it fired strips of 30 bullets. And that's a couple of uh, guys from the 96 firing it back at the Japanese. <coughs> okay. Well, that's a sad story. Uh, that's uh, the army has a battle monument on Okinawa, and uh, each army division has a battle monument. Uh, has a monument there, and we were called dead eyes from our marksmanship. Uh, dead eyes hereabouts. The 96th Infantry Division suffered over 10,000 casualties. Their sacrifice testifies to an unsurpassed measure of devotion, pride, and courage. Thank you. Okay. Well, in working for my book, I got all the morning reports from Company L. And this happened to be the roster of the men that landed on Okinawa on April 1st, 1945. Third platoon, 35 men, plus one man that was a replacement platoon leader. And the men that are shaded in blue were wounded in April, and the men were sh sh shaded in orange were wounded in May, and three men were sent sick to the hospital. One was a combat fatigue, and one was a guy that had been wounded on Okinawa, on Lady, 
and really have, wasn't been properly healed when he came back to us. So you can see that of the landing troops, we had 100% casualties by May 20th, 60% of the way through the battle. And, that's, and the only thing that saved us, kept us going, was replacements. And uh, we got some good replacements, and they had a tough go. Most of them were 1944 high school graduates, and you can imagine being thrown into a situation like that. And we had uh, the, first, the first guy in the top center is, is uh, Dick Young, a friend of mine, personal friend of mine now for many years. And he was the uh, platoon leader when we landed on the 5th of April, where we got our first uh, uh, dose of Japanese artillery fire. Company commander was wounded, and he moved up. Another man went to became company commander, and he became the exec officer. And then on the 20th of April, he got shot quite badly, uh, Fitz, Fitz, Fitzpatrick, and uh, Jack, uh, Dick Young became the company commander, and he was wounded in action on the 16th of May. And uh, Love Company had six company commanders during the battle. The first five of them were casualties. Okay. Okay, good. Anything else, then? Oh. Uh, I'm giving part of my talk so I can. Okay. This here is an up to date, accurate tabulation of the, member, me, the people that were killed in action, died of wounds, or miss, missing in action. And this, the, the prefecture of Okinawa in 1995 dedicated what they called the Cornerstone of Peace Monument. Beautiful black marble panels, and on these panels they have uh, the names. They were, they were gracious enough to have a U.S. section, and uh, they listed 5,521 Army men, 5,191 Navy, 3,263 Marines, and 30 civilians. One was the famed correspondent, Ernie Pyle, of the, of the 30 or the fatality when they really reconciled and got thorough on all the casualties, killed, died of wounds, missing in action, totaled 14,005, not the 12,000 figure that was frequently given. And at this dedication, they gave me a booklet that listed all the U.S. casualties. And, uh, I counted them. There were 14,005 14, U.S. names there. Tell us, where did you grow up? In Was your neighbor, Wisconsin. Where did you go to high school? Big pardon? Where did you go to high school? Went to high school in Barron, Wisconsin. Okay. And then uh, why did you join the service? I went in the Marine Corps in... San Diego, California. I went overseas. The um, first campaign I was in was Cape Gloucester, an island of New Britain. I was shot by a Japanese machine gun through the left side and left leg. The next one was Peleliu. I spent all the time that I was in the service in, in an infantry company. I was on uh, Okinawa, where I was awarded the Bronze Star Medal. On, <laughs> uh, all together, I spent about 150 some odd days on the front lines fighting. On southern end of Okinawa, well, my company ran up against a Japanese pillbox. Uh, but they, uh, some Japanese inside, so they called up an interpreter, tried to talk the Japanese coming out. They would not. So we uh, prepared a satchel charge of a plastic, plastic explosive called Composition C. We placed this up against the back door 
and bang, down she went. Come charging out of that back door are six or eight Japanese. A fellow that is standing up on the top cut most of them down with his Thompson submachine gun. We got the rest. Up until this time, I had only gotten as a souvenir was a Japanese flag with a lot of writing on it. So I thought I should get a few more souvenirs. I went over to that rifle and I took off this bayonet. <laughs> and uh, I went over to the, this body and picked up this scabbard. I tried to put the bayonet in the scabbard and it wouldn't go all the way. So, why not? Bill, you tell him what you see here. <laughs> Bullet hole. Bullet hole. Right there is a bullet hole. So what did I do? I thought that'd be a good souvenir. So I took the scabbard and I took the bayonet along with me. I thought that'd be a good one and I kept working at it and finally one day it went clear in. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, uh, on the Japanese bayonets, they got a little hook here. What's that for? If they ever get in a Japanese flight, this is the Japanese and here's the American. If they get into a, ja a fight, that Japanese can run us up there and grab the Americans and there he could wrestle them down. That's what that little hook is for. So, I put it in my pack. I've had it 64 years. Thank you. Yeah, this one's for Jim. Uh, it looks like, uh, Jim, looks like you uh, have a short finger there on your uh, right hand. Did you lose that trying to put that bayonet in the scabbard? <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I noticed your plane there. Were you in, involved in any way with the turkey shoot at Saipan? No. You missed a good show. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was uh, in Hawaii at that time. We were just getting checked out on the carrier when the Marianas turkey shoot took place. I wish I would have been there. They, they had a good time. By the way, you might be interested to know that uh, when I was recalled to Korea, I met a Japanese pilot uh, over there. And uh, the plane, one of the planes that I'd shot down was a very good friend of his. And they were in the, they were in the squadron. He gave me the guy's name and, and so on. Made me feel bad. But anyway, uh, he was a medical doctor at this time. We became very good friends. Matter of fact, we even got so we could sing together and so on. So I still know some of the Japanese songs that we sang as, as parties and so on. And, uh, but uh, it was interesting. That guy could speak English better than I could. He knew English exactly as it should be spoken. And uh, so it was really, really very interesting getting to know him. All right. Uh, Mr. Sloan, uh, why were the uh, ja why were there so many Japanese civilian casualties? Uh, apparently, when they first invaded, there was uh, the the villages and farms were largely deserted. Had the had the Japanese army basically rounded up the civilian population and and concentrated them? No. Take the mic. Grab the mic, Bill. What the Japanese had done is they had. Uh, brainwashed the, Italian, uh, the Okinawan civilians to the point that they were deathly afraid of the Americans. Um, they had told the Okinawans that uh, the uh, Americans would rape all the women, butcher all the children, and, you know, kill all the men, obviously. And a lot of them c committed suicide rather than uh, subject themselves to the imagined horrors that they were going to face at the hands of the Americans. 
that was what that pile of bones that uh, you saw on the PowerPoint, that was all civilians that jumped from cliffs down into a, a gorge and killed themselves. And that's a, that's a famous picture too, right, Bill? The, uh, the women, children r jumping? Yeah, yeah, right. Can you talk about the uh, impact of the kamikazes, the number of ships, the number of planes? They, the they sank 36 American ships during the battle and damaged, uh, in most cases, severely 10 times that number. Yeah, yeah. And uh, somebody mentioned the uh, Karamaretto. That's where they towed all these, uh, these poor old picket destroyers that had been decimated by the kamikazes. This was a graveyard of ships that they had out there, and uh, just scores of them. Uh, and some of them were towed back to the States in, in attempts to uh, repair them, but most were beyond repair. The flight training and, and also the college, uh, how long was it from when you went in until you got through with the training and, and uh, went active. Thank you. From actually uh, the total numbers of months from the time we first started flying until we got our wings was 13 and a half months. Um, the first stage was uh, uh, light planes in, in uh, uh, Aberdeen, South Dakota, and I got to know very fast the difference between a good instructor and a lousy instructor. Uh, the lousy instructor was not only an alcoholic, but also a heavy smoker, weighed 240 some pounds, and when he got out of the airplane, he almost killed me on my s solo flight because the tabs were on the front, and he got out, and his weight completely changed the engine, so when I took off, I went like this and almost clobbered myself. But anyway, um, he was kicked out by the chief flight instructor uh, one week later because he was doing loops right over the top of the hangar, snockered, and the, he, the, little, the, the chief flight instructor clobbered him and said, get out, don't want to ever see you again, and then I got the chief flight instructor, and he was a wonderful guy, made the difference. So in human beings, we have A to Z in many different areas. We've heard from several branches of the um, service, and we do appreciate all that you did for us. But one branch that's often forgotten is the Coast Guard. And uh, my husband was in the Coast Guard, and um, I thought perhaps um, it might be nice if he could cheer a little bit of his time there. Well, I'm a Colorado boy transplanted to Minnesota, but I did spend my time uh, beginning at the age of 15 uh, with the United States Coast Guard because it seemed to me that uh, what was going on in the world uh, would find an end, and uh, unless I did something, why, uh, it would pass me by. So like many other uh, boys my age, we took a chance. I. Uh, Thought about the Marine Corps, but they were killing a lot of them uh, in the South Pacific at the time. And uh, I thought then about the Navy and decided that uh, they would probably catch me in my lies. And I thought perhaps the Coast Guard would not be quite as astute. And so I walked across the uh, hallway there in Denver and uh, signed on with the Coast Guard. And did my time at uh, the government training island in, in uh, Alameda, California. Uh, mortified when after graduation from boot camp they put me on the beach with a dog uh, for about a month and uh, then thankfully a boatswain showed up one day and asked if anyone could ride a horse and uh, out of all the men there I could and so I went on minor patrol for about nine months until that was over and went to the Pacific in time to uh, get in on what was happening at Leyte and from that time forward. We were, I, my ship, the Aquarius, was one of 53 Coast Guard vessels at Okinawa. Could one of you uh, veterans of the battle t talk a little bit about the food? Somebody had to bring food up and, and supply you guys. Uh, uh, how'd you eat and uh, was it really good stuff? 
Um, first of all, on aircraft carriers, the food is fantastic. <laughs> and we had a lot of Navy beans, and it infuriated me sometimes to hear some guys complaining about the food. Um, now, I'm a guy, I love open space, so that's why I was never completely satisfied on the ship, because they were just too crowded. But the food was wonderful. Now, uh, for example, in Korea, we were living in tents, and uh, we had mud and so on, and we were living on K-rations all the time. But you know what? The food was great, even though it was K-rations and various other rations also. And we didn't have any, well, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> well, and lady, we outran our supply, and I can remember catching a chicken and wringing its neck. <laughs> and uh, we tried, but it rained all the time. You try to cook a chicken when <laughs> in the rain, it doesn't work too darn well. <laughs> but, but we ate that sooty, half-cooked chicken. I remember that. Uh, that was the <laughs> worst meal I ever had in the Army by far. On Okinawa, we had K rations and C rations. And uh, somebody mentioned a satchel charge. We used plenty of these satchel charges, and you could pinch off a bit of that C2 explosive and light it, and it would give you a nice hot flame, very hot flame, and make a little soup sometimes. And uh, towards the end, they got 10 and 1 rations, which were a big improvement. And it was ten, ten in, uh, meals for ten men in one box, and the trick there was to get there first and get the good stuff. <laughs> for a short time on the southern end of Okinawa, there was so much rain and everything, they couldn't get up to us with trucks or amphibian tractors with nothing up on the front lines. They come over with Navy dive bombers and bombed us with K rations and C rations, but we, half of the time they dumped them on the Japanese lines. <laughs> uh, but we never did suffer much. We'd dig up uh, garlic and onions in the, Japan, in the Okinawa's gardens we shot their pigs, and we got along good. I never did run out of food ever there. I don't have, I don't have an awful lot to add here, but in the Navy, uh, we were a very small ship, 150, 158 feet long, and um, we lived out of canned food all the time. And one of the greatest thrills that we ever had was pulling up alongside of a destroyer and asked for ice cream. And lo and behold, they gave us a bucket of ice cream. That was the biggest eating thrill that I had during the war, I think, at that time. <laughs> and then there's also, the, some of you guys in the Navy, you know about the uh, mutton and the sheep, the, the, uh, the mutton, right? Some of you remember that. Uh, you had to take the mutton to get the beef. So we took the mutton, and the first time the cook prepared the mutton, it smelled up the ship so bad, and it tasted so horrible that after that, nobody would eat it. So we had to, after that, the rest of the war, we had to take the mutton, and nobody would eat it, so we had to throw it over the side. You know, what a waste. But that's what happened. The government insisted that we take the mutton and we would not eat it. I have a question. Um, what were your ranks when you left the service? This rank? is for everyone at the table. Your rank in the service. Oh, oh I was a lowly lieutenant junior grade. And, First uh, lieutenant. That was, that was it. Okay. <laughs> well, I went all the way through the ranks up to lieutenant colonel when uh, I got out, but during that time period, I was a second lieutenant, and then a first lieutenant, and then a captain, I guess. Your rank? Wow. I didn't rank anybody hardly. I was a PFC. 
<laughs> the bulk of the guys, well, we had virtually 100% of our casualties were 100% casualties in our platoon sergeants, section sergeants, and most and squad leaders. And uh, I was a mortar gunner, acting squad leader, and uh, all-purpose uh, PFC. <laughs> <laughs> I might mention that we have a Corsair pilot here. We got some good close support by uh, the Marine Corps Corsairs. They come from front line out here, <coughs> they come from behind here, come over our heads and fire their machine guns and fire their rocket. But one day there was a sad incident. The Corsair was just about above us and not very high, and it was firing rockets, and all of a sudden the right wing blew off. <coughs> And the thing did a spiral over and crashed by right behind the Japanese lines. And that was a sad occurrence. But uh, the Marines Corsairs did good close air support. The only trouble we, uh, the Navy sometimes came at air support firing in the direction of us. And that was a little scary at times. <laughs> My rank was corporal, uh, uh, squad leader most of the time. Could you explain uh, what the picture, picket ships were doing, where they were, and why it was dangerous? Okinawa was surrounded by picket stations. I, I forget offhand how many of them there were, but there's probably about 30. And they were about 40 miles off the Okinawan coast, uh, most of them concentrated to the north and the west, as I recall, but there were also some to the south, and they were usually manned by a couple of uh, destroyers, and uh, they, their job was to uh, try to intercept these uh, kamikazes and keep them from, you know, hitting the uh, main uh, troop concentrations and naval concentrations right around Okinawa. Uh, it was very, very dangerous uh, work, and many of those destroyers were hit uh, some of them were sunk and uh, lots of men killed. A couple of big aircraft carriers were uh, pretty well gutted by the uh, kamikazes as well. But the picket stations, they were radar stations, and uh, they could pick up the uh, Japanese planes like about 300 miles away, and they saved a lot of lives. Uh, how much faster was your Corsair than the F-6F? Well, I flew both airplanes. The, uh, the F-6F was the best carrier airplane that was ever built. You could, you could uh, uh, align the plane up and just take your hands off the controls and it could almost fly itself right into the carrier. You couldn't do that with the Corsair. Corsair was faster by, uh, at different elevations, but if you get up to 30,000 feet, the Corsair was about 30, mi 30 miles an hour faster approximately. It, but it would vary by different at different uh, altitudes. But the Corsair had some wonderful aspects of it. It was not the best carrier airplane until you really had some time in it because of the long nose, it sort of blocked out the, uh, the LSO is the guy, the landing signal officer on the carrier, and uh, that long nose sort of blocked it out. So you had to keep turning constantly coming in to the, uh, to the carrier. Whereas the F6F had a sloping nose, you could even come in straight in. So it made a big difference on those two. But I flew both of them on carriers, and uh, between the two, of course, I, I just feel so strongly about the Corsair that uh, I would take that. What, what was it? Was there a Japanese tactic that was uh, more typical? Were they offensive, defensive? Did they leave themselves exposed so that you could do strafing? Or did they kind of pop out of a hole, do what they shoot something, and then go back in? Well, a basic Japanese tactic uh, was defensive, except uh, on the 4th of May they tried a big offensive, and it was a terrible disaster for them and a, a bonus for us. But basically they were had pillboxes and caves and trenches and, and on all the ridges with interlocking fields of fire 
and they were very good at a reverse slope defense. Uh, the advantage of the reverse slope was, of course, that our direct fire weapons couldn't hit them, but you could hit them with the mortars, for instance, a high fire weapon. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we were on the offensive 90% of the time, or if not more. And uh, when you're out in the, on the offensive, you got to get out of your foxhole and you got to move out and you're exposed to enemy fire. And that's what caused the large U.S. number of casualties. <coughs> the, uh, the Japanese rifle was inferior, but they had some very good machine guns. And they had uh, what we mistakenly called a knee mortar, which was really a grenade thrower, but they converted it to a 50 millimeter mortar was very numerous, and this was, uh, and they were skilled at using them. And uh, one trick I learned as a mortar gunner, particularly on a dark day, and there were a lot of dark days, is you could catch the trajectory of that projectile going up about two thirds of the way up, swinging over and coming down, and you could project backwards to approximately where it fired from. And then we'd immediately turn our 60 millimeter mortars on that area and it generally would silence them. But uh, <coughs> the Japanese didn't surrender. I would say the big difference in the war between the Germans and the Japanese was there was no basic rules of conduct in uh, fighting the Japanese. In my outfit, we didn't wear any insignia of rank. We didn't wear any insignia of organization. Uh, our medics carried rifles. Our chaplain was a good M1 marksmanship. And basically, if you were trapped, you either fought your way out or you died. And that, that was it. And we were not very uh, humane, you might say, on either side, I would say. It doesn't sound impossible at all. Uh, no, 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 I say it's not impossible at all because you can only get so much. Just like, I don't care whether you're in the air or whether you're on the ground. You can never get 100% of anything that you're trying to do. But one thing that we trained very, very hard on was you never, never hit the ground troops if there's any problem at all. So we operated specifically with air controllers. And that works very well because you got two people and you got a guy that's down below you that was there. But even with that, now I was at the Chosen Reservoir uh, for the for the where the Marines and some Army people were there. And one of the guys at one of our programs said, you know, he said uh, one of those Corsairs came over and said uh, I got hit with several shells. Well, he got hit with the empty cartridges. See, and so we had to go right over the top of them to get to the Chinese. And as you're shooting, those shells keep coming out. And he had his helmet off, and he got hit on the head with one of those shells. Now, it didn't hurt him specifically, but he, was, he had me worried for a minute that we might have hit him. Earlier, Mr. Sloan mentioned about the Okinawan civilians being brainwashed by the Japanese. And I'd like to give you just a, a short example of that. In one place, we were setting up our defense for the night and a patrol went down in front to see what was in front of us so that we couldn't be surprised they found a bunch of civilians in a cave well you got to get them out of there because many times Japanese soldiers would hide in there with the civilians so they, we had little books of Japanese phrases and they tried to talk them out of there and they refused finally the lieutenant said smoke them out so he threw a white phosphorus grenade into the cave. 
And that brought them out, and they filed out, and they came up through our lines. And there was one man who had shielded the rest from that grenade. He was very stoic, and he walked out under his own power. His skin, in places, was split just like a wiener on a grill. Yeah. And uh, I looked at him, I felt very sorry for him, and I wanted to, I wanted to treat him as best I could. And the, and the lieutenant said, save it for our own men, he'll, he'll be taken care of when they get back. So all the heroes weren't on our side. There was a few elsewhere. Right, right, yeah. You were I was a corpsman. I want to thank all of you for coming this evening. I want to thank Barb for getting these guys going. And you can say. Okay. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. And next May now, next program, we'll see you there. Thank you much. Bye. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.